Hello and welcome to the Geeks Review. I'm Royce. I'm Jacob. Today, in our sort of final episode of Geeks Review for a little while, at least on the radio, we're going to be talking about a new series coming to the station, something that uh, I had a hand in and you had a hand in. Yep. And that is The Misadventures of Agneta DeVoe, returning for its third series. We're going to be talking about the uh, the story, the behind the scenes memories, and uh, just general stuff about the show, and let you know when you can listen to it, where you can listen to it, and what it's all about. Should be good. Yeah, it's a bit of fun. Shameless self promotion. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Only kind. Have you heard about Andor? Actually, I've, I know the name. Yeah. I never watched Rogue One, so. Oh really? Yeah. I think it's considered by a lot of people to be, you know, the best Star Wars film, but those people think that a match of Battlefront 2 makes for a satisfying narrative experience. <laughs> it's just, it's very um, light on character because, you know, it doesn't keep them around for very long. And yeah, it's... There's, there's it's, hints of it. It's a suicide mission mm. style thing. But Andor's good, you know, I'm, sort of um, really I'm, quite dark and serious. And I'd rather just a series about Alan Tudyk's character. I think he is coming into it, Because yeah. Alan Tudyk's just great. Yeah, he's not in it first. It's crazy that they've had it in production since like 2018 and we were doing like series two of Agneta yeah. talking about Andor and it's like, it's going to be so good, Kato ASO is going to be back on screen and they say he's not, but he probably will be. You never yeah. know what these things do, you? Yeah. yeah. It's from the the writer of um, the Bourne films. Actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's nice and in depth. And so the convoluted nonsense. <laughs> it is a bit. It is a bit. Fiona Shaw's good. Um, you know, Aunt Petunia from... Oh, yeah. Harry Potter, she's great. She plays his adoptive mother. Oh, there you go. That's all right. And it's a bit of a bit of a Breaking Bad sort of thing where, well, Better Call Saul, where you've got like a, a 40-year-old actor playing a 20-year-old man. <laughs> but it works if you don't yeah. pay too much attention to the wrinkles and just think, oh, he had a rough life. He had a rough upbringing. Just turn off the brain and just go with it. Yeah. But yes, The Misadventures of Agneta DeVoe is a fantasy mystery series coming to City Park Radio. It stars a bunch of actors, local and international. Yeah, I wrote it. You starred in it. Indeed. Played a few characters. Several times. Yes, you played many. You've, there was a sort of a point in series one where you were just playing everyone. I believe you referred to me as your Mel Blank. <laughs> I did, actually. You did, yes. Just because every time you thought, Jacob, can you record this? Yeah, all right. <laughs> it was you and Holly. You know, it was like the shared response. But I need a male voice? Jacob. I need a female voice? Holly. I did, I did volunteer for the female voices, but <laughs> I think my I couldn't quite get the uh, tone right. Yeah, it's tricky. I've tried myself, but... Yeah. Yeah. But yes, uh, this is a fantasy mystery series, which I said. It stars um, local actress Liz Corrick as Agneta DeVoe. She's an elf woman who uses her criminal knowledge and magical powers to fight monsters and solve crimes and also solve monsters and fight crimes. And she's joined by her best friend, her partner in crime fighting, Termel Izard Robertson, a human politician who wants to do good, but because of his sheltered upbringing, doesn't exactly know how to go about doing that. And the trio of main characters rounded off with Charlotte Evanshaw, Tamel's oldest friend, a former dancer who was forced to give it up to appease her family, who uh, owns the tavern where Agneta lives. So this uh, third series is made up of 12 episodes. We did a series one of six episodes back in 2017. God, and that long ago. <laughs> yeah, it was quite a long time ago. <laughs> My God, that's, we've been doing this for that long. Well, to be fair, we had a few years off. We did, yeah. Yeah. COVID got in the way. Yeah, and I took forever to write the script. <laughs> <laughs> that too. But I mean, you know, that's to be expected. Script writing is hard. Mm. I couldn't do it. No, it, it is tricky. I, admittedly, I got to the end of it and sort of thought like, oh, that was easy. And now I'm just like, oh my God, I, actors aren't getting back to me and I'm going to air in a week. What do I do? <laughs> yeah, that's the tricky part. That is the tricky part. Trying to track down everybody. So how did you become involved? I saw it... Actually, my wife saw it posted on Facebook. They're looking for voice actors. She was like, you should do this, Jacob. You like doing voice stuff? I was like, oh, that looks like fun. Hmm. So then I applied to it. You got back to me. I was like, cool. I came in, did my interview. We're wearing the same jacket. It was very funny. That was it. Yeah, I'm still wearing the same jacket. <laughs> <laughs> um, didn't get the part I auditioned for. Which was that? I auditioned for the bear guy. Yeah. Way back in the day. But funny enough, I still got involved in this, ended up doing all the budget extras. Yeah. It was a lot of fun, though. And then I wrote a character for you, Harry Dorian. <laughs> yeah, good old Harry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was, that was Aaron as the bear, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, he did a fantastic job, to be fair. Because I did more of a deep voice, cockney voice, whereas he did a lot more threatening, menacing voice, which did suit the character better, to be <laughs> fair. So I can't really exactly blame you for that. Yeah, I've had enough of you, Cassius. You've ordered me around for the last time. 
He also had this, this iconic moment, the Acacius. <laughs> oh, God, I forgot about that. Yep, the goat man. Yeah. The prisoners are in the tent. Do you know what Gassius is going to do with them? <laughs> ah! <laughs> uh, good times. Yeah, there was a story where a bunch of wizards um, accidentally turned themselves into half animal people. And it turns out that uh, one of them sabotaged a spell because he wanted to be a bear. Tuesdays, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a really grim bit of trivia about that. The guy's name was uh, Treadwell, which was a reference to um, Timothy Treadwell, who was that nutter in Werner Herzog's Grizzly Man who got eaten by grizzly bears. Right, yeah. Very grim Easter egg I had there. <laughs> uh, you know, a little bit of grim history is always a bit of fun. Well, fun might be the wrong word here. <laughs> I did have a lot of Easter eggs, actually, um, because the main character's name, Anyetta, came from Anyetta Filskog from ABBA. So there was a lot of ABBA references. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think Tomel asks her, you know, oh, is there anything else we can do? Oh, knowing me, knowing you, it's the best we can do. And there was a Spice Girls reference. What, well, what do you want from me? I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want, is to find out what your motive is for harassing innocent market traders. But first, we're going to go for a little ride. You and your bloody references, Royce. <laughs> <laughs> did make for a good time, though. It did, yeah. It did get a lot trickier uh, once uh, lockdown came in. And a lot harder to record as a big group after that, so... Yeah, and with most of the cast being overseas, it was a bit tricky. Yeah, that point. First season, it was almost entirely just Launceston people. Most of the cast came through the door on the first day. Yeah, we just kind of walked in and said, we want to roll, and because it was a kind of new thing, <laughs> you were like, yep, cool, people actually want to do this, fantastic. Pretty much, exactly. Yeah, and which yeah. makes sense, it was your first go at doing a radio play and everything, and this is quite a new experience for all of us, to be fair. Mm. Yes, and we're no better, <laughs> no, no more knowledgeable than we were back then. Uh, we do the best we can, though, don't we? Maybe a bit more jaded, but you know. <laughs> I mean, we've got a bit more practice now, at least. Yeah, it's yeah. A start. It's a start. I still sound the same in every goddamn role, but you know. <laughs> I will say, I think my most standout role was as the troll. Yes, we're going to play some audio of that. <laughs> oh, good, I love that audio. I <laughs> shredded my vocal cords recording. Oh. Shoot. <laughs> shoot. Shoot, 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 Still, the troll continued after me, gaining on me before I spun and lobbed the stake at its head, trying to spear it. How much editing did you do to the voice afterwards, too? Because I don't think you needed to do much editing to it. I think I lowered the pitch like a point or two, but not much. Yeah, because I've obviously thought got a reasonably deep voice as it is. Yeah. And this is my first time I'd tried roaring like an animal. Roar! And that was <laughs> novel, and my God, it was a lot of fun. I was very happy with the performance. But my throat was shredded afterwards. God, yeah. Should have really done some proper vocal warm I sound like Joan Rivers afterwards. <laughs> oh, dear. Worth it. <laughs> yeah. And I remember just sitting there, like, listening to it back. And um, Chris, our producer, was playing it through the, the speakers of the studio. And it was like everyone was just cracking up again. Because everyone in the same studio um, basically just sat apart. You know, there was a lot of um, feeding off in each other's energy. Yeah. And, and trying to laugh. A lot of fun for it. Because there's a lot of just making each other just break character and laugh and all that <laughs> which did you know hop back production a bit but it did make it for a very more close-knit feeling it did yeah production, which is nice he was making a mockery of the hard work and dedication people like galen have put blah 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 <laughs> <laughs> were you there when um robbie's character had his death scene i was yes that was yeah time. He um, fully keeled over onto the floor doing it. and The man commits. That's <laughs> some music like, on GarageBand, just like, duh, duh, trying to make it sound more dramatic. It just goes on and on. It's very drawn out. <laughs> very. I do recall you had to reel me into in my death scenes. Because I'd always be like, <laughs> all right, Jacob, we just need you to just bring it back a little. What was, um, <laughs> this is really politically incorrect but you played um a racist character once you played like there was this scene it was it was a very out of date racist pewdiepie reference oh geez yeah <laughs> yeah so like it was probably like 18 months after the whole scandal happened by the time we actually recorded it and went to air <laughs> yeah but it was like and yet it got stuck in the thing with a, in, in a warehouse with a bunch of racists and you played one of them <laughs> You played one of the racists, so you know. I was trying to get into character, and I'll admit, I wasn't the most comfortable I've ever been performing, but <laughs> look, I was trying to channel your typical douchebag YouTube yeah. racist, and I was like, I, I've got some good lines, but I didn't like, I didn't feel good. 
No. I felt unclean afterwards, but... It was a very convoluted episode, that one. Like, trying to explain that is like, oh, I'm not, I'm not even going to attempt it. In I'm... fairness, the racists did all suffer horrible deaths, so it was, you know, it was a happy ending. It was a happy ending, very happy ending. Yeah, any time mm. racists burn to death is a happy ending. <laughs> Already um, kind of bigot, really. It's a feel-good story. We did get one bit of feedback about the series, and it was when um, a, a character based upon a certain senator from a certain state in, a, in Australia was uh, being horrible and racist, and, and yet it throws her off the train. <laughs> And the response was, oh, my God, I cracked up so hard when Agneta did that. Yeah. <laughs> Which was great. Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, good to hear justified. that. Justified. Yeah. <laughs> because if you live in Australia, you probably have not a fair idea. <laughs> you know, the type to wear inappropriate clothing to par- Parliament to make a statement. Or yes. to climb a big rock because someone said she couldn't. Uh. Tool. <laughs> We're not political here. Or are we? Who knows? Uh, Always political. I mean, everything's political. Everything's political at some mm. point or another. We're all, we've all got some kind of political beliefs. Mm. Anyone who says they don't just means they're a spineless <laughs> status quo lover. Mm. He doesn't want any kind of change. Change for the better. Things certainly were different before these newfangled changes. Well, of course they were, you senile old ghetto. They wouldn't be changing. <laughs> anyway, we're talking about the misadventures. Yeah, so, well, <laughs> stop tangenting, you two. So, um, yeah, the Fantasy Mystery Series has our elf woman go on all kinds of adventures and... Um, well, misadventures. Misadventures, true, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the opening episode, which will be airing next week, is called The Fog, where we have a bit of a recap of Series 1 and 2 at the beginning and kind of explanation as to who they are. Which is good, because none of us remember either. <laughs> um, it's narrated by a, uh, an actor, I believe he's from New South Wales, called Michael Mangada, and he brings a lovely sort of dramatic flair to the role and plays another role later on in the show as well. But Agneta is approached by a wizard who tells her that uh, there was a break-in at the magical library and a dangerous book has been stolen and he needs Agneta to track it down. And Agneta goes, yeah, sure thing. And when Termel goes, you know, oh, you're going to go deal with it? She goes, nah, oh, I've got other stuff to do. She wakes up the next day and there is a horrible, noxious red fog covering the city. Everyone's like choking to death and she braves the, the fog and... Manages to confront the person who was responsible and... Um, I don't spoil the whole episode, Royce. I don't, look, I don't actually listen to it. <laughs> um, or maybe I should just say, you know, oh, the, the, the culprit gets away with it. But it kicks into gear a big story arc that um, goes across all 12 episodes. And it should be really fun. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. I've played a few roles this season. That was good fun. Uh, who was your favourite? Probably the Scarlet. Ah, Yes. The tattered jackanapes. Who's, yeah, that, um, was, that was a bit of fun. I only had like one line, but it was fun. <laughs> In episode uh, three, that is. So yeah. a few weeks from now. I just like playing kind of natural characters. It just makes for a fun performance. Yeah, I was trying to get you into the energy by jumping around like a fool. Two by four, they knock the door for Grub to fill their plate. Five and six, he kicked out the sticks. Lay him at seven and eight. <laughs> uh, yeah, and Nut Jobs is in this. The dude obviously is just like, Likes killing people, not as in he has any actual mental disabilities. We're not making fun of... Yes. I would hope not, because obviously we've both got a few uh, cogs loose upstairs ourselves. <laughs> this is uh, more just your typical Jack the Ripper type. Yeah, it, well, well, but he's actually inspired by um, Spring Hill Jack. Yeah, Spring, that's it, Spring Hill Jack. Yeah, and that's the episode with the uh, shameless um, Charles Dickens character. Who's also played by me, come to think of it. Kind of doing a Kelsey Grammer. Kind of being kind the of, word here. Yeah, almost. An attempt was made. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage, Charles Callow. There was nothing to suggest about that warm summer's night that peculiar things were afoot at Endelwine Hall. When indeed, peculiar things were afoot and taking place that night. I mean, I'm pretty happy with most of the formats, but you know, it's, it, it, it's tricky. You have a, a role in episode four where you're playing like this sort of evangelist. And he's yep. this. Um, Ironically, also called Jacob. Yes, it was um, sort of. That was a happy accident. Happy accident, yeah. <laughs> it was inspired by the, uh, the recent comedy series by Danny McBride, Righteous Gemstones. And I remember when I got you in the studio, I'm like, oh, you know, this is kind of the character I wanted to go for. So I pull up a few scenes from the show, and it's just like the most inappropriate stuff I could have pulled up. Yep. It's like, oh, no, <laughs> I'm sorry. But then you remembered it's me, and I have very thick skin for these things. I was still pretty red-faced. You know? oh, you're getting who you're talking to. Right? I saw everybody 
Jacob Goodbride. Ha <laughs> ha, pleasure to be here. This is going to be a great show for you all here. Yeah. Take a seat, my friends, and close your eyes, open your minds, your hearts, your souls. Breathe it in. Yeah, but that's a fun one. And um, hopefully it doesn't annoy too many people. <laughs> Oh, I think we all did pretty good there. I really like Josh's performance in that one. Yeah, Josh. He, he really went all in on that one. It was good. I will say, Josh has a great evangelical voice. Like <laughs> You can just feel the passion of Christ. It's really good as well um, with Josh. Is I remember when he came in, he was you know involved in Series 1. Mm-hmm. And I think we were all a bit nervous. Oh, God, we were all just kind of... Except for the ones who were still actively in local theatre. Yeah, yeah. Like, I hadn't been in theatre for quite a few years when I did this. Because so I used to be in theatre when I was younger at the time. I mm. loved doing the theatre, but I'd been, you know, focusing on work and everything. So I'd been out of the theatre for a while. So I was a bit nervous. I'm not sure what to do with myself. But then you got the kid, the guys who are all still very active in the local theatre groups. And- yeah, they just went for it, you know. Yeah. I think I struggled because I play Termel not very well. Um, <laughs> I kind of struggled to think, like, okay, what do I want him to sound like? And I sort of went for my natural voice in this one. And it, I, I don't know, it still doesn't feel right. But it is what it is. And that's how it is with some characters. You can never just sometimes just can't figure the voice you want for them. Mm. The villain though sounds good. The actor we got for the villain. Series three promises some of her most formidable foes yet. Yeah, who else did we annoyed? <laughs> I'm trying to remember the plot of the second season now. I don't remember the first season. I remember the last season. Second season was a bit more broken up, um, but we began with a very mm, dour murder investigation because I remember when I sold this as like a murder mystery series and then we barely have any murders <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it was um the painter in the park where a-, a lady was found dead and like she was killed in like a 30 second gap so it was kind of like who did it how when where why yeah it got a bit serious got a bit too dark I think a bit too dramatic because it was kind of like a broken families and you know yeah. the real ramifications of something horrific like that happening a bit too much <laughs> bit too grim for your palate. Yeah. There was the um, the ghost episode where there was a haunted house and been haunted for like 80 years and um, this young couple had bought it, you know, super cheap and ghost was there. So Anita goes in and sure enough, there's a ghost of a young girl and the angry like poltergeist of her mother and it's sort of uncovering the mystery of like, okay, where's the father, you know? What happened? Why are they still here after all this time? What can we do to fix it? And it was just really... Wonderfully written, wonderfully performed. Um, Keith Wiggins played the father, and, you know, he brought a sort of manic energy to it. It was really fun. Yeah. Othing, let them go! You! How did you find my sanctuary? I was led here by the people you tormented. Tormented? (laughs) They're merely waiting. Once I succeed, we'll be a family again. And they'll understand. But he himself couldn't remember it last time we spoke. So what was the last one we did? It was um, what was the Cowboys? I remember that one. I don't remember. It was a while ago, to be fair. Because we did that, then we did line goes between that and then season three. So this, yeah, we've done quite a bit, and just because it's been spread out over like five years, which just kind of our memories just kind of uh, fail us after a while. Mine is quite good with some things to the point. It's like, oh god, that was five years ago. What the heck? <laughs> I'll re- vividly remember certain things and then just completely blank on others. But like, what other memories you have of the series? Oh, let's see. I just remember a lot of gas bagging, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. A lot of uh, mischief and nonsense and silly little comments in the background. and just That's why it takes so long to get these things done. Yeah. <laughs> Half the session is just us making each other laugh, which did honestly bring a good energy, though, because you feel a lot less awkward when you're having a joke with people. And yeah. That did bring out some good performances. Yeah. I know they're going to get some weird stuff in theatre sometimes. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's So it. you kind of know, no matter what you do, it's not going to be as bad as whatever they're doing. <laughs> that's theatre for you. Good fun, though. Pretty much. I do remember I used to have a problem standing too close to the microphone. That mm. took me quite a while to get the uh, hands through my head. Yeah. Do you still do it sometimes, to be totally fair? Mm. You know, I'll learn one day. Yeah. We do have a fun episode coming up with... Um, this was a very late addition to the series where... I put up um, an advert on Star Now, and I'd had a few people apply from like all around the world, but I'd mostly targeted Tasmania. And so I sort of thought, ah, oh, I won't target Tasmania. I'll just go wherever, you know, get some people to come in and whatever. It decided to target the UK. And yeah. when I woke up in the morning, 100 people from the United Kingdom had applied to be in our Tasmanian radio play. Funny in- how these things work. <laughs> including one actress who had played quite a prominent role in um, Doctor Who. 
Yeah. Um, she was a, a blind girl in the episode. Um, it takes you away. I think it was. She didn't end up getting back to me, but it was like, wow, well, that's that's crazy. You know, she's applied for this. That's that's wild. But there's one actress called Cat Leroy, and she was born in the Czech Republic, lives in London. She's apparently been like a, an extra in the Spider-Man Mysterio one. What was the one with Mysterio? Oh, yep, yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, she was in that. And um, she has this great accent, and I was kind of like, you know, you're not quite appropriate for the other actors we have, but I'm going to write you a role. And she plays a, a witch called Trina, who has the ability to um, enter people's minds and recover memories, and she's trying to solve the murder of her parents a few decades before, and there's a lot of twists and turns. And Trina, wait. What makes you think that this sword thing is even going to be in any books at the library? I've gone through all of them, and if it's something that's famous... How haven't I heard of it? I had not heard of potato chips and record players before I come here. But they're everywhere. Doesn't mean they didn't exist. Perhaps you just have been reading the wrong books? Okay, yeah, true. And we do have a very um, blatant Halloween spin-off. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically just Halloween, you know, just change the guy's name to Michael Myers. Yeah, you know it is. It's, a, it's parody, it's fine. Yes, homage. Yeah, that'll do. That'll do. That sounds well. like a good. That sounds like that'll hold up in court. <laughs> so this is the misadventures of Agneta Devoe. We're um, talking about this new series that I and Jake had a part in. I created and wrote it, and it'll be airing every Thursday at four PM on City Park Radio, and it'll be available to listen to online. It's about a lady who, an elven lady who solves crimes and fights monsters. You know. Yes. But no, it, it, it was a lot of fun to record all the seasons and everything. It was because this was my first real foray into radio work and mm. really enjoyed it. I loved it. It's one of my favorite things to do when I'm not sick or at work. <laughs> but um, it was a good experience and I'm looking forward to season three coming on the radio. As am I. Just waiting for one more actor and I'll be ready to go. <laughs> There's always one. Always one. I was going to say, in regards to writing, um, you know, a lot of people have ideas about fantasy worlds they want to write a lot of young people especially and i think now with everything so saturated where everything like seems to get a film adaptation or a tv show adaptation people kind of think more about writing films when they're writing books yeah and it's quite tricky with this series to kind of think oh this is i can imagine how this would play out in my head if it was visual oh no but we're an audio thing so we need yeah. to make it suit for that and I think as well, people get bogged down in the specifics of writing fantasy, like um, all your lore and, and stuff isn't always necessary. Like I, one time I sat down, and <laughs> I wrote out the, the full list of kings and queens who ruled the country that Agneta lives in, not dating back 1,400 years. Which would never come up in the story whatsoever. <laughs> Pretty much. I did find a way to squeeze some of it in. That is what appendices are for, though. It did allow me in that one case to kind of go like, okay, we're going to have the villain... He's going to do a monologue and he's going to compare his current plight to this historical plight. And it kind of worked out nicely there. It kind of sounds like it's a legitimate thing. Like there was a king who was sort of ineffectual and his country was taken over. And the guy who took over the country was kind of like, you know, I'm going to give my people all the riches of this big country. But then he basically just spent the next few years partying and spending it on himself. Sounds about right. And then the king who was kept as a prisoner basically realized, oh, the, the cell was unlocked. So he just wandered out and found the, the guy in the hot tub and just stabbed him. As you do. And, you know, became king and he was sort of like hailed as a hero and he's just like, ah, whatever. <laughs> Sick. Just doing my job. <laughs> and that added a nice bit of context. But yeah, um, that's, a, I guess, a tip for, for writers. Um, don't get too bogged down in the specifics. Just focus on story and character first. Yeah. We're not all, we're not all Tolkien. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You are a bit of a Tolkien buff, aren't you? Oh, I do enjoy a touch of Tolkien. Mm. More than a touch. But yeah, you, you don't... Because he is considered by many to be one of the, if not the father of the fantasy genre, as we know it today, as we perceive mm. it today, a lot of people seem to think they need to try and be like him. They need to have very deep lore and all this, and elves and dwarves and wizards and orcs and all that, which is fine. It's great to have that kind of structure to work off, but you don't need to be Tolkien anymore. You need to, need to be George R. R. Martin or Raymond A. Feist or anything. You can just make your own stuff. Write what you want to write. If what you want to write is law heavy stuff, I mean, sure, okay. Well, law heavy stuff can be a lot of fun, but mm. just remember, just make it yours. Well, yeah, I mean, Agneta DeVoe sort of came about because I was always looking at fantasy going, like, it's always medieval. 
But the setting of Vignetta is like Industrial Revolution. It's like the 1860s. It's like, yeah, which is good. It's that. Me. So it's kind of to see that there's still magic. There's still dragons and, well, and like, elves and stuff. I never read the novels based off, but the movie Stardust, which was mm. fantastic. And it felt, because when I saw it, I haven't seen anything like it. I was like, this is really cool. It's like magic and stuff, but it's feels like it's in a more Victorian setting as opposed to medieval. And yeah. It had like flying airships and cross-dressing Robert De Niro. And yeah. Sword <laughs> fights and jewels and really hot... Yeah, that was a great film. A few images still stick in my head, which was um, Robert De Niro in the dr- in the dress, and you had Grandpa Joe like um, somersault over a wall, <laughs> yeah, over Charlie yeah. Cox, and then you had at the end uh, one of the villains is like killed and then puppeted his corpse. And it's, oh like, yeah, really played by um oh what's the actor's Mark name? Strong. Mark Strong, who mm-hmm. I really like by the way, love Mark Strong. Yeah, Mark Strong's great. And he was good in that too. And Michelle Pfeiffer was <laughs> awesome and yeah. as usual because God, she's just gorgeous. Mm. But also a really great threatening villain in this one. The main character and the main girl, who I'd never seen anything before that. Yeah, they I think both, she's in Homeland. They were both perfectly serviceable. They, mm. did ex- they did good jobs. Yeah. It was just fun. It felt like a classic fantasy story, but it still felt like its own story. Like, it hit a lot of the same, you know, the hero's journey tropes, but it still felt like it was telling its own story. It wasn't trying to ape off anything else. Hmm. And that's something I really appreciated about it. So that was good fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it wasn't quite a reaction to anything. No, it was just that someone wanted to make their own story. I'm pretty sure it was based on a novel, mm. which I've not read. Yeah, no, neither. <laughs> but it's good. It's like How's Moving Castle, which is based on, again, based on a Dinowin novel. But that also, again, felt like its own fantasy world. Very much so. Yeah, well, most of Jubilee's fantasy ones all felt very unique, though, which is what she was good at. Mm. It's just so Miyazaki's such a miserable prick in real life. <laughs> <laughs> and some of Junji Ito is just this cinnamon roll. How does that work? But yes, um, this has been our review, or preview, we should say, of The Misadventures of Agneta DeVoe, a new fantasy mystery series coming to City Park Radio next week and for the following 12 weeks. Yeah. I wrote it, I started in it, Jacob, you started in it. A bunch of local actors and international actors, all very talented. Twisty tales, convoluted stories, stuff. You know, it's good. Yeah. Hopefully you like it. Yeah, hopefully. And Otherwise you can... we've wasted our time. <laughs> Wait, what was it all for but yes you will enjoy it or else this has been the Geeks Review I'm Royce I'm Jacob and we'll be back in a few months time bye for now toodles <laughs>